modern airliners were among the most complex and reliable machines in common use. But occasionally, delays in fixing a known defect have led to disaster. This is the story of one of the most terrifying and avoidable accidents in recent history. When a 747 suffered a devastating explosion at high altitude, the crew and passengers faced an unprecedented crisis. It is also a story of how one family's grief led to a relentless investigation to uncover the full, disturbing truth. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. And it reveals how other known problems in aircraft design have continued to go uncorrected, causing further avoidable accidents. So would I be surprised if it happened again? I would be surprised if it didn't happen again. It is a matter of time. One of the most shocking cases of a known design flaw being ignored for years would finally take its toll on a United Airlines 747 bound from Honolulu to Auckland, New Zealand. As Flight 811 prepared for takeoff, the crew were concerned with another kind of threat that had recently led to tragedy. We were in the aftermath of Lockerbie and I had instructed the crew to be particularly aware because um, it was a through flight from Los Angeles going through to New Zealand. So um, in my pre-flight briefing, I had asked them to make sure that they checked uh, any baggage that looked suspicious or anything because uh, we wanted to be extra cautious. Flight 811 was heavily loaded. 337 passengers packed cargo holds and a full fuel load. The doors closed on time and the plane left the gate just before two o'clock in the morning for a routine eight hour flight. When we were going to New Zealand on vacation, some place that we had really thought was interesting and somebody had told us how beautiful it was. So this was kind of a dream come true. I was seated in what's called the upper deck. I hadn't had a vacation in five years. And I took all my mileage plus points from United Airlines and I purchased a business class ticket to Auckland, New Zealand and Sydney, Australia. And I was gonna finally make that dream vacation I'd always wanted to get to uh, Australia and lay on a beach somewhere and forget about airplanes, forget about accidents and, and, and get this out of my mind for a while. Dave Cronin was hugely experienced, just two Rotate. months short of retirement. Rotate. I flew uh, almost 35 years with United. I've got over 30,000 hours of flight time and just about everything uh, military as well as uh, civilian. My co pilot, our first officer, was uh, Al Slater. And I've known Al at that time for probably 20 years. And uh, the second officer, Mark Thomas, was the first time I had flown with him. But uh, we got along real well. Tell him we can handle 33 if it's available. Okay. The pilots wanted to climb United to 33,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean to avoid turbulence yeah, from bad weather. We did notice that there were thunderstorms 100 miles south right on course, which was rather unusual for that time of night. So I left the seatbelt sign on. Captain Cronin's decision to keep people fastened in their seats would save the lives of many. We were still climbing out, and the seatbelt sign was still on, and um, just basically getting ready to uh, serve beverages and then to tuck everyone in for the evening because it was going to be a long flight down to New Zealand. Okay, tell them we're going to detour over to the left. Center, United 811 Heavy, we're going to be detouring. Some weather here, uh, it'll be to the left, of course. A hundred miles from Honolulu, 
As Flight 811 climbed through 23,000 feet, a critical malfunction was about to occur. There was now a huge air pressure difference between the inside and outside of the aircraft. Suddenly, passengers sitting just above and behind the cargo door heard a noise. Then there was kind of a grinding noise. I heard a, like a thud. What the hell? In the next nanosecond, it was pure, unadulterated pandemonium. We lost number three, we're going down. It looks like we've lost number three engine and we're descending rapidly, coming back. The next thing I knew, I found myself on the stairwell, hanging on to the rungs, and I immediately knew it was an explosive decompression. The cargo door had torn off and ripped a huge section of the plane with it. The pressurized air inside blasted out with explosive force. I immediately thought of Lockerbie. We actually thought it was a bomb that went off. It was hell on earth. Everything on the airplane that wasn't fastened down, tied down, or secured, what became airborne. Um, the noise was incredible. Everything in front of us was gone. Where we were sitting, we were about six inches from the hole, so there was nothing in front of us or to the side of us. The whole side of the plane was gone. Actually, our feet were dangling on the hole, and uh, I first thought we, we weren't going to make it. You know, I just didn't think there was any hope. With the pressurized air blown out, the lack of oxygen at 23,000 feet was now suffocating the passengers and crew. It felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach, um, knocked the wind out of me, and um, I remember trying to catch my breath and couldn't. You were supposed to grab those oxygen masks and put them on, except the oxygen masks in that cabin, they were ripped out of the ceiling and they weren't, they weren't there. And um, I remember thinking to myself, this is what it feels like to suffocate. United 811 Heavy, we're doing an emergency descent. The pilots could tell from their instruments that the number three engine was failing, but they couldn't tell the full extent of the damage. Their priority was to get the plane down to a level where they could breathe normally. Put your mask on, Dave. But the pilots didn't know that the explosion had destroyed the entire oxygen supply. Uh, I can't get any oxygen. We're not getting any oxygen. You getting any? I can't get any either. With the plane heading steeply down and no word from the cockpit, the cabin crew feared the worst. I remember thinking that the cockpit, which is up in the upper deck, had probably blown off the airplane too, because as far up as we could see, there was nothing there. Now we're doing this nosedive. My, my next thought was, oh my God, we're, we're just going straight down. We're going to crash into the sea. With its airframe ruptured, severe damage to the right wing and engines, and the crew forcing it down in an emergency descent. The problems on Flight 811 had just begun. Devastating explosive decompression. Flight 811 was still in a steep emergency descent, passing rapidly through 15,000 feet to reach breathable air. 911 Heavy, say your altitude now. Leaving 15. United 811 Heavy, we're out of 15.5. United 811, Roger. I think we blew a door or something. Tell a flight attendant to get prepared for an evacuation. The crew finally began to level out at a safer altitude. But they now faced a barrage of problems. The most immediate was the disintegration of the number three engine nearest to the explosion. We don't have any fire indications. I, I don't have anything. Okay, we lost number three. Let's shut it down. There's no M1. Yeah. Okay. Ready for number three shutdown checklist. Uh, number three. Before you shut down number three, the generator went off. Looks all right to try it now. Well, 
want to stop the vibration anyway. Fuel jettison procedure, main boost pumps. On. Center, United 811. We need the equipment standing by. Company notified, please. We got a control problem. Roger. Center wing, left, right, valves on. Start dumping the fuel. I am dumping. One stewardess had been seriously injured by falling debris. As Laura Brentley helped her, the full gravity of her situation suddenly became clear. As I'm holding her in my arms, I looked up, and as I looked up, that was the first time I saw this tremendous hole on the side of the aircraft that was just a void, and seats were missing, and I immediately knew that we had lost passengers. Five rows of seats had been blown out in the decompression, killing nine passengers. On the flight deck, the crew had turned the stricken plane back to Honolulu. But with 80 miles still to go, the crisis now got far worse. We got a hell of a control problem here. I got almost full rudder on this thing. Are you dumping as fast as you can? I'm dumping everything. We got a problem with number four engine? Yeah. Debris from the explosion had also damaged the number four engine. If it failed completely, the implications were severe. If you are on two engines and you weigh 700,000 pounds, that is a big deal simply because with that kind of weight, two engines are not gonna keep you in the air. You're gonna come down. Can you maintain 240? Yeah, just barely. We're losing altitude. No, it's... Center, United 811 Heavy. Do you have a fix on us? Affirmative, sir, I have you on radar. Okay, uh, we've lost engine number three, and we don't have full power on engine number four. Uh, we can't hold altitude right now. Uh, we're dumping fuel, so... United 11 Heavy, Roger. I show you six zero miles south of Honolulu at this time. Uh, Roger. I haven't talked to anybody yet. I, I can't get to them. Uh, you want me to go downstairs and take a look? Yeah, let's see what's happening down there. I think I uh, we lost a compressor, but... Can't uh, hold... Can't hold altitude. Yeah, I told them that we're going to... Put gonna... some max on there. I got takeoff power on this thing. Whatever you need, Captain. Although the number four engine was failing, the pilots pushed it, along with the remaining engines, to full power, a setting they should not be run at for more than four minutes. But the nearest land was 50 minutes away. I look out the window on the right-hand side, and I see flames, big flames. And I know what flames in the engine means. It's not good. The pilots were unaware that the number four engine was now on fire. You got 250 knots now, that's good. Uh, 7,000. Uh, yeah, oh, we're getting more rumble. Watch your heading, watch your heading. You want to go direct Honolulu. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go downstairs and see what the hell is going on. Yeah. Go ahead and run down and see what's happening. I saw the flight engineer descend down the stairwell. And when I saw him, my, my relief was, oh my God, they're, they're alive and I, there was a huge sense of relief for me. He saw the hole, turned as white as a sheet, and I screamed to him, dear God, please get us down. We got a fire out there. Oh yeah, we got a fire in number four. Go through the procedure, shut down the engine. We're not gonna be able to hold this altitude on two. We got a fire on the right side. We're on two engines now. The whole right side, it's, it's just gone from about the one right back to a, it's just open. You're just looking outside. What do you mean? It looks like a bomb. Fuselage? Yeah, the fuselage, it's just, it's just open. Okay, it looks like we got a bomb that went off on the right side. The whole right side is gone. Yeah, from, from about the one right back to uh, anybody. Some people are probably gone, I, I don't know. I knew that we had lost people. I didn't know how many. Uh, in fact, I didn't know until the next day how many were lost. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing when you're a captain of an airplane and you lose passengers. Lee Campbell, flying home to New Zealand, was sitting in row 10 just in front of the cargo door. I woke up with 
such a start because I had seen Lee standing by the bed, just with this with a grey jacket over his arm and a small smile on his face. And of course, as I woke up, it faded, wasn't there. And then we woke up in the morning, we discussed this. I said, oh, no, that was strange in the night, but I, it was such a, a vivid dream. Lee was standing there. And then the radio came on, and the first item of news is that there'd been a problem with the United aircraft. And I said, that was Lee, that's Lee's. And my blood just ran cold. I, I knew he was dead from that moment. Center, do you read? We evidently had a bomb or something. A big section of the right side of the airplane is missing. 911 Heavy Roger. I wouldn't go any faster than I had to because that, that pull, I mean, I, I wouldn't get it over 250 knots because that's a big... Okay, what's, what's our stall speed? I wouldn't go below 240. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to make this. We didn't know that we were going to make it back. So we were actually preparing to ditch that airplane at night uh, in the Pacific Ocean, which has never been done before. In the cabin, the crew prepared for the worst. My training kicked in and um, got up for my jump seat and started instructing the crew, um, we have to prepare the cabin, we have to, you know, prepare for a ditching, which I thought was inevitable. You're running around getting life vests on, and I do remember thinking, I'm not sure this is going to matter um, because when we hit the water, you know, um, I just imagine the plane's going to split apart. I, I knew that if we hit the water, it would be a tantamount to hitting the ground and there would be very few of any survivors. So my mind went to the things that, that meant something to me and at that point in my life it was my son. Believing they were going to die, one passenger took these photographs in the hope they'd be found in the wreckage and give clues to the cause of the crash. For 15 minutes, the plane steadily lost altitude. Then, at 4,000 feet, the first glimmer of hope. After an imponderable time, um, I remember one of the passengers began to point out one of the windows on the right side. And everybody looked. And we looked through this little window from wherever we were, and we could see a point of light, and another point of light, and another point. And pretty soon, you could make out a coastline. OK, I've got lights over here. OK. OK, now we're at four. Uh, we're 21 miles out. We're in good shape. At Honolulu Airport, an emergency was declared. All other aircraft were diverting. The rescue services prepared for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner. Hey, you want to give me some speeds? Yeah. Uh, 150 is going to be your two engine. Uh, use a 160. Souls on board if you have it. Okay, souls on board. 160 is the minimum. Uh, standby, United 811 Heavy. I don't know how many's on board. Uh, 200 and. Uh, I don't have the paperwork in front of me here. Uh, we're too busy right now. Uh, 200 and something. Okay. Six minutes from the airport, the crew now had to slow the overweight plane for landing. But the effect of this was unknown. What's going to happen when I start coming out with flaps and landing gear? Uh, we're either going to land on the airport, in the water, or downtown Honolulu. We'll try 10. Okay, inboards are coming to 10. Out of the controls field. All right, so far. But the flaps were damaged and could not fully extend. This meant that my daughter had to land dangerously fast. Do you have 811 Heavy? Do you have the airport in sight? It's over here to the right, Captain. Okay. Okay, we have the airport. United 811 Heavy. 811 is clear to land. 8 left. Room is standing by. Wind 05012. 
Clear to land. Eight left, United 811 Heavy. As the unstable 747 lined up for landing, the pilots knew they would only have one attempt. But even if they got it on the runway, the nagging question remained. Would the stress of impact cause the damaged and overweight aircraft to disintegrate? Severely damaged, with an unstable airframe and losing altitude on just two engines, Flight 811 now began its final approach to the Two-engine approach. Two-engine approach. We still had no idea how far off the ground we were, if we were going to make it to Honolulu or not. But that seemed like an appropriate time if we were somewhere around land that we are probably going to try and land somewhere to um, get the passengers in their brace positions. So that's when we started yelling for them to get down in their brace positions. Every molecule in my body combined to express, get this, Damn airplane on the ground. Well, how are we doing on the hydraulics? Hydraulics are good. You got brakes? Normal hydraulics. So we got brakes, but uh, you're only going to have reversing on one and two. Though I thought maybe there was a chance that we were going to actually be able to attempt to land. The thought came to my mind, what happens now? Do we, an impact, do we explode? Do we fall out this huge hole? Despite dumping fuel, the aircraft was still critically overweight. But without full flaps to keep it in the air, it had to approach fast. Thousand down. The danger was that the undercarriage could shear off and the plane break up. A dot and a half high. 190. A little slow, a little slow, Dave. It's below what we want. Coming up on the glide slope. Okay. Well, let's try the gear. No one knew if the explosion had damaged the landing gear. I remember Laura saying to me that she didn't hear the landing gear go down. And it was loud, you know, the, it was still loud, and I didn't hear the landing gear go down. So that's another thought, maybe they can't get the landing gear down. Maybe it's not down. Got gear down, we're clear to land, and everything's taken care of as far as we know. Two hundred. 195. Half a dot high. Looking, looking good. 192. 195. Coming off on the power. 100 feet. Feet. Center of the trim. Center of the trim. Thirty. Ten. Zero. We're on. Gears holding. We landed. It felt fast. And that was my next concern is that we weren't going to stop at the end of the runway, that we were just going to keep going. And all of a sudden we were slowing down, slowing down. And I, I said, oh my God, we've landed. We're, we're on, on ground. And the people started applauding. Probably the best landing I've ever made. When we uh, finally stopped on the runway, 
We deployed all 10 chutes and the flight attendants evacuated all of passengers. It's amazing how fast everyone went. My understanding is like less than 45 seconds, 330 people were off the airplane. We were probably 20 feet off the ground and I would have stepped out of the airplane without a slide. I, I wanted to get off so bad. Fortunately, there was a slide. I stepped into the abyss, fell into the slide, whooshed down to the, to the bottom of the thing, and then you, you, you hit feet running. The slide kind of kicked me up and flew me up into the air, and I, my thought was, oh my God, I'm going to survive this whole thing, and I'm going to get wiped out here on the evacuation because it just really threw me. And I landed and scraped up my legs pretty badly and landed on my feet, and it wasn't until that moment that I had the sense of, I'm here, I'm okay, I'm on the ground. When we got all our switches off, I ran through the airplane, made sure there was no one else on the airplane, came up to the door, one left, and went down the slide, and I came around the front, and I saw that humongous hole in the side, and I just couldn't believe it. By the grace of God, we made it, and uh, it was a, a, an awesome experience. I, I would never want to go through that again. It was crazy, it was wild, it was scary, all at the same time. Um, I just thought that that was the end, that we were gonna die. I mean, it, it, that was my first thought, that this is the end. But for the families of the nine people who were killed, the ordeal was only beginning. Kevin and Susan Campbell's son Lee had been flying home. About three o'clock in the afternoon, I think they said that uh, there was no New Zealanders involved, but we just knew that, that it, it was Lee. And then about, I suppose, a quarter of an hour later, we got a phone call from Chicago and they just said that they, they regret to inform us that our son was missing, presumed dead. And I guess about another hour after that, a policeman arrived at the door and he took one look at us and he says, I can see that you've had the news. So um, it was just, just an awful, awful day. And uh, it certainly didn't get much better for a long, long time. Although Lee's body had not been recovered, the Campbells flew straight to the wrecked aircraft in Honolulu. Your initial feeling is that you want to be as close to the spot where your relative died, um, and that was the aircraft, so we had to immediately go in and see the aircraft. The damage inside was horrific, just a total mess. And the hole in the side of the aircraft was much bigger than I had thought it would be, even though we had seen television news reel reports. And it was so sad to get in and actually see where Lee's seat had been. The legs of the seat were still there. There was a good bit of fuselage beside him and still a window. But the Campbell's desire to find the cause of Lee's death inevitably brought them face to face with dreadful details. They took us to the medical examiner's office as well um, because they had found body parts and, and that sort of thing. So um, they didn't actually show us the body parts but they showed us bits and pieces that they had recovered from the engines and um, we got the medical examiner's report on what they had recovered. So, um, you know, we really would have preferred that it was Lee that went through the engine because it would have been an immediate death, whereas it was a four-minute fall down to the ocean, and we know that the people could have been alive as they were falling. And when you think about that, that's just horrific. As it became clear that their son's body would never be found, the Campbell's need to find the cause of the accident that killed him grew stronger. 
Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. The Campbells embarked on a relentless personal investigation that would last nearly two years. The loss of their son meant they would stop at nothing to uncover the truth. The engines number three and four. Two no months after the accident on Flight 811, when the National Transportation Safety two. Board held preliminary hearings, the Campbells made sure they were there. But they soon grew frustrated. The NTSB the would not complete its report for months, so the, the Campbells took matters the into their own hands. Opening. We certainly weren't going to leave it to the, the NTSB to, to come up with the findings. We were going to follow through. And when the hearings ended, they had said that we could take whatever we wanted off the press table. And Susan walked up to the top table and yelled out, there's a, a really good set up here. So we uh, grabbed a box and loaded in all of the, the documents that we could find up there. Kevin's the most honest of people I know, but here he was taking something that we hadn't specifically been told we could take. And we're heading out the door just as the NTSB were arriving back in with the trolley to, to pick up all their documents. So we were out the door and into a taxi and gone. So we quickly realised we'd got a really good set of papers with a lot of things that hadn't been released to the public. We were able to really start our investigation in earnest at that stage. The unpublished documents revealed a disturbing catalogue of problems with the forward cargo door, going right back to its original design. Instead of a plug door that gets jammed into its frame as the aircraft pressurises, Boeing opted for an outward opening door. This allowed for more cargo space, but was not fail-safe like the plug design. So Boeing built what they believed was a foolproof locking mechanism. What they do is they build in multiple redundancies to make sure the door is properly latched and does not open. Uh, and you, you build it in to a point of, uh, that it's extremely improbable that the door would ever open. So what went wrong on Flight 811? The Campbells soon discovered that the problem lay in the design of the locking mechanism. To lock the cargo door on the 747, electric motors rotate C-shaped latches around pins in the door frame. A handle then moves arms, known as locking sectors, over the top of the C-latches to prevent them from reopening. But as early as 1975, problems were found with the locking sectors. Kevin Campbell, an engineer by training, built a model to show the weakness in the Boeing design. Initially, the, the locking sectors were made in aluminium, and in 1975, Boeing realized that they weren't strong enough, and they actually doubled up the aluminium to make it double thickness. But it still wasn't uh, strong enough, and a lot of the airlines didn't even put the doublers on anyway. The weakness of the aluminium drastically increased the risk of the door accidentally opening. With the aluminium locking sectors, if the sea locks tried to backwind, open electrically, it would just push the locking sector out of the way. It just simply wasn't up to the job that it was designed for. For 20 years, 747s have been flying with this crucial weakness. wondered what else remained to be revealed. They redoubled their efforts to uncover the full truth behind the accident that had killed their son. We bought a car and set off in the United States to see as many people who were involved with the accident as possible. We started at Seattle, down to Denver, across to Chicago, through to Washington, D.C., down to Kentucky, on to Miami, and back across to San Diego, back up through San Francisco, back to Seattle. And that was just one trip. The Campbells soon found that a shockingly similar incident to Flight 811 
had given clear warnings of the dangers in the cargo door. In 1987, two years before Flight 811, a Pan Am 747 had been climbing out of Heathrow when it failed to pressurize at 20,000 feet. The pilots had to turn back. When they got back to Heathrow, they found that the door was hanging open an inch and a half at the bottom, and all of the locks were open. When it got to the maintenance base, they found that uh, all of the, the locking sectors were either bent or broken. Why had the sea latches turned and bent back the locking sectors? Boeing claimed that the ground crew must have mishandled the mechanism. The door had been closed manually, and what they said happened was that the guy wound the sea locks close, 98 turns of a speed wrench, he closed the outer handle, and then wound it open again. And if to be in the position that they were found in when the aircraft got back, he would have had to wind them open 98 turns. And this is just absolutely ridiculous. But the Campbell's investigation uncovered another vital clue to why the sea latches had turned. A report by Pan Am engineers highlighted problems with the door's electrical system. It had a fault in the S2 master latch lock switch that should have turned off the power to the, uh, the door when the outer handle was closed. This was an alarming finding. When the outer handle was closed, the S2 master lock switch was meant to disconnect the power supply and stop the sea latch motors from turning. So could this have failed, allowing the motors to open the door? To find out, Boeing asked the airlines to do a simple test. Close the outer handle, then press the switch to open the door and see what happens. When they hit the switch, it actually worked. The Boeing thought, you know, this is not going to work, um, but it actually worked. There was power to the, the door locks with the, uh, with the outer handle closed, and the lock started to move, and it started to force the locking sectors out of the way. And uh, a few days later, the airline started ringing in and saying it was damaging their planes. So Boeing stopped the test. But it meant that on those aircraft, the S2 switch had failed, which is a silent failure and all of those aircraft were, were likely to have the same problem as A11. They were just waiting for a short circuit to open the doors. The Campbells now became convinced that the accident on Flight 811 began with the failure of the S2 switch. Power remained on to the sea latch motors. All it took was a short circuit in the 20-year-old wiring, which had been found to be frayed on other aircraft, to start the motors up. The aluminium locking sectors were too weak to stop the latches turning, and the cargo door burst open. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the After waiting a year for the NTSB report, Kevin and Susan Campbell expected it to match their theory of what had led to the accident on Flight 811. I assumed that we would have a report come out that this was an electrical malfunction and were staggered when they came out and said that the door had been mishandled. The report focused entirely on the fact that the door lock must have been mishandled by the ramp attendant. That was disappointing and we felt that they must have been at a different hearing from the one we were at. So how had the NTSB come to their conclusion? There was other evidence that we had found during our investigation of uh, improper procedures by the United Mechanics and, and ramp people. So we were convinced that there was, um, we could use the word abuse being done on the doors. The doors were sort of abused and weren't maintained very well. We concluded that the probable cause was mechanical. For the Campbells, the NTSB's failure to mention the electrical problems just wasn't good enough. What they said happened was the door was closed, the locks didn't fully close, they just partially closed, just hanging on the, the pins, and then they closed the outer handle. But it just simply can't happen because that part of the locking sector is, is still intact. Just simply can't happen. You can't close the outer handle unless these are in the fully locked position. 
It's the only way that the outer handle will close. And just closing this manually, you can't exert enough force to actually damage this part of the locking sector. All it does is just butts up against there. If the locks aren't fully closed, it just simply butts up against them and goes no further. They went back to investigating the accident on flight 811 and soon found disturbing evidence of how it could and should have been prevented. After the Pan Am incident in 1987, it turned out that Boeing had issued a directive to the airlines on how to correct the weak aluminium locking sectors. The airworthiness directive that came out was to replace the aluminum sectors with steel sectors that could not be bent. And there were some additionally, in, some interim requirements for inspections to be performed uh, until the, what they call terminating action, the uh, steel sectors were installed. The fix was cheap and simple, but getting it done was not. The actual cost of the modification, changing these locking sectors to steel, was 2,000 US dollars per aircraft, but it took 10 hours to do it, and that's where the money was, taking the, the aircraft out of service for 10 hours. That's millions of dollars. The Campbells found that back in 1987, the Federal Aviation Administration, who were meant to enforce improvements, had given the airlines 18 months to comply with the modification. Within a year, Lee Campbell and eight others would die in an avoidable accident. So why weren't the airlines forced to fix the problem sooner? If these airplanes, these large commercial airplanes, are grounded, it's an economic disaster. So what they do is they lobby in the regulatory agency in the United States, it's the FAA, um, to allow them to do the fixes over time when the airplanes are in for normal maintenance. And that way, they're not taken out of service. But when they do that, when they allow the airlines, the air carriers, and the manufacturers to fix these over time, in essence, what the FAA is doing is they're gambling with the lives of the passengers and the crew that are flying the airplanes during the time they're not fixed. After the deaths on Flight 811, the FAA instantly shortened the deadline for fixing the cargo door from 18 months to just 30 days. It was only when United had gone from one of the airlines of first resort to one of the airlines of last resort in New Zealand that they just totally out of the blue we got a, a letter inviting us over to see them. And when we got there they were just going to do a PR exercise on us. But uh, we just laid into them, pointed out where they'd all got it wrong. And you could see them changing during it to, to realising that we did know what we were talking about and that we put a lot of serious effort into it. One of them actually broke down because um, I'd never had to meet next of kin before. And it ended up with um, the Vice President of United taking us round the uh, maintenance facility and he had people running off in all directions just to get the information that we wanted, questions answered. We could go anywhere with that we wanted and uh, we just, everything was, was laid on for us because they, they, at that stage they realised that we really did know what we were talking about. The pressure of the Campbell's campaign eventually began to pay off. The vital piece of evidence that could prove them right, the cargo door, still lay two miles down in the Pacific Ocean. But as articles appeared in the American press, the NTSB commissioned the US Navy to search for it. A hundred miles south of Honolulu, a deep submersible began to trawl the seabed. We went to Honolulu and uh, waited there while they had their attempts. And they finally recovered the door from 14,000 feet of water, which was the deepest recovery ever at that time. 
and we were phoned within an hour of it coming out of the water. But before the Campbells could see it, the door was swiftly removed to Boeing's plant in Seattle. The Campbells went in hot pursuit. We went over to Boeing and they wouldn't show it to us. So they, they reckoned that uh, the crucial pieces had gone to the NTSB. So again, we got in the car and drove across to, to Washington, D.C. We arrived at Ron Schleed's office, and Ron looks at his watch and he says, I can give you five minutes. So about three hours later, we had the, the pieces that they recovered in our hand, and they acknowledged that we were definitely correct. It was an electrical malfunction and that they said they would fix the planes, they would make sure it never happens again, but just don't hold your breath that the report will never be changed. Even with the evidence of an electrical malfunction in their hands, the NTSB refused to change their report. Then, in June 1991, fate intervened. A four-year-old United 747 was sitting on the apron in New York when the sea latch motor started up and the door opened itself. There was no way that they could hide it any longer. They simply couldn't deny that it was an electrical malfunction that was covering it. After recovery of the door, was that in fact the actual piece... Finally, the NTSB publicly issued a revised report that concurred with the Campbell's version. There was an inadvertent failure of either the switch or the wiring that caused an uncommanded opening of the door. It's nice that other people know that you're right and had been all along and that the support that they had given you was, you know, was vindicated. The Campbells spent thousands of dollars of their own money on their campaign. They were never interested in a financial settlement for Lee's death, but they did persuade United and Boeing to set up a university scholarship in his name. I couldn't have lived with myself if we had done no investigating ourselves. It was just something we both felt we needed to do. We didn't even discuss it. We just knew that's what we would do. Yeah. But despite long and public campaigns like that of the Campbells, critics fear that the airline industry has not learnt the lessons from Flight 811. The regulatory agencies, they have a dual charge. One is to encourage aviation, and another is aviation safety. And when they get in a position where you have economics up against air safety, they tend to err on the side of economics rather than safety. Serious accidents caused by known defects have continued to occur. In the 1990s, known problems with icing on aircraft wings caused a series of crashes. At least three planes have had fatal fires, due to known dangers from flammable insulation material. And in 1996, a fully laden 747 blew itself up when known faults in the wiring are thought to have ignited flammable vapors in the fuel tanks. Inevitably, experts are skeptical about the aviation industry's record of balancing profit against prevention. We've seen the wiring problem both in United 811, which was eventually turned out to be the cause of that accident, and also in uh, TWA 800, where we had an explosion in the centerland fuel tank. This, the, the industry answer to 20 and 30 year old wiring, and when the wiring can fray, break, crack, cause a short, which can either ignite fuel, like in, in TWA 800, or open a cargo door, like in United 11, and what the industry says, don't touch it. Don't go in there. Don't inspect it. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to remove it because it's so brittle that if you go in there to try to fix it, you're going to do more damage than you can do good. And, and that's what I call the ostrich approach to maintenance and safety. You know, we've decided that you can have an spark of ignition in the centerline fuel tank of a large air carrier. Um, but so far we've been lucky, we've only had one every 10 years, we've only blown up three or four airplanes. Um, you know, to go in and replace this wiring would ground all these airplanes, be astronomically expensive. You know, one airplane every 10 years, one airplane every five years, two, three hundred people, cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. And, and that's a great economic analysis, and unless your mother 
or your child is on board one of these airplanes that happens to pay the price for their economic satisfaction. For some of the survivors of Flight 811, the cost has been heavy. Each crew member handled it differently. I know there are still two crew members that have never set foot on an aircraft again. It was very difficult for me. I was diagnosed with uh, severe post-traumatic stress disorder. You can't reason, you can't think. Making the slightest decision is, is very difficult. You're, you're just at a total loss. So it was very difficult to cope with. 